Before we get into this analysis, I'll say this. Under the Silver Lake may be the most ambiguous movie ever made. Unlike movies like The Holy Mountain or Memento that have purposeful decisions made to give audiences clear answers to the questions the film poses, this film is the exact opposite. This is the counter to these films because the clearly purposeful decisions made here lead to very unclear or ambiguous answers. So if you have a different interpretation of something in the film or of the film itself, I'd love to hear it in the comments. This is one where there doesn't seem to be any wrong answers, so let me know how the movie affected you. With that out of the way, Under the Silver Lake is one of my favorite movies of 2018, but it's one that you won't get everything out of on a first watch. Even after multiple viewings, there is so much about this movie to unpack. Whether it's solely character or story based, or in this movie's case, actual ciphers to decode, this movie is so jam packed with things to uncover, codes to break, and plot lines to explore, that it manages to hook me in even after a ton of viewings. So let's start with the basic premise of the film. If you don't know what this film is, it's about a man named Sam, played by Andrew Garfield. He is a bum of sorts living in LA. He has an apartment that he's behind on his rent on, a girlfriend that ditches him because he smells like a skunk, and he has an insatiable desire for sex. But what he does have is a lot of time to uncover secrets directly linked to a new girl that strikes his fancy. She shows up at his complex one day, but by the next morning, she mysteriously disappears. Thus sparks the core of what makes this film, Sam going through thick and thin to find this mystery girl. Hello. That's the basic rundown of Under the Silver Lake, a movie that on the surface sounds simple and fairly straightforward, but as you'll come to see, it's anything but. Before we dive into the feature film, let's start off this witch hunt of codes by perusing the film's poster, which, like the film itself, seems pretty straightforward. A girl's body is being dumped into a body of water with some palm trees at the bottom, hinting at the film setting. But as we take a closer look, things are not as they seem. As we zoom into the girl, you can see it's just some nondescript girl. It's the bubbles that are of interest. At the top of the poster, we can see a Jesus Saves Cross, which is a reference to Jesus and the Brides of Dracula, which is a band in the film, and they are quite important to the overall story. Then we have a pair of binoculars, one of the hobo symbols, the balloon lady, and even the pirate guy, plus far more little objects and faces from the film hidden in there somewhere. But the little secrets don't stop here either. As you can see in the girl's hair, the word sex is spelled out, which is a major part of the film. Then further down in the palm trees is Andrew Garfield's face. And of course, the film title itself is referencing Silver Lake LA, where the film is set in and around. But the setting goes much deeper than just taking place in Hollywood. This movie is about movies, it's about Hollywood, the entertainment business, the 1%, the men in charge, women that are exploited, secret societies that run the world, etc. It's about everything. So setting the film in the heart of show business to critique show business is an incredibly smart move. I'm sure I'm missing some things on this poster and in the title and in the marketing, but I think you get the idea. Even though these little things don't have much sway in the film itself, it is quite neat to see a movie putting work into making the poster a perfect reflection of the film, which we can finally get into. But before we do, one last thing I want to say before we get into it is that there is a subreddit dedicated to decoding and fully understanding this film that I will be referencing as we go on from here. So I'll put a link to that in the description for you to go hit up. Okay, so straight off the bat, this film hits us with a simple code. It flashes a unicorn, a tiger, a snake, and a lion to the beat of one of the amazing tracks from Disaster Piece's wonderful score. So what does this mean? Well, this is a pretty simple solve, actually. If you take the first letter from each of the animal's names, you get UTSL, which is the acronym for the film itself, UTSL or Under the Silver Lake. Anyway, the first thing that we see in the actual film is a big Beware the Dog Killer graffiti on this coffee shop. The dog killer is of course a subplot that develops a little bit further on so we'll cover that when it comes up. Then the camera pans through this diner and we see yet another code on this man's t-shirt which we can see many other people wearing at various times throughout the film. Using the same method we used at the start of the film the shirt deciphers to 
B-W-A-R-D-O-G-K-I-L-R, or Beware the Dog Killer, another reference to this dog killer subplot. We then pan over to meet our main character, Sam, who is watching the lady scrub away at the dog killer graffiti. He turns, and then it seems like the sign is almost looming over him, which again becomes more relevant later on. Also, take note of Sam as he turns around. He sort of smirks at the dog killer sign, which is an interesting little touch to this character and to this plot line. But then he starts staring at these two girls behind the counter, which is our first indication of what type of character he is. Sam is a bit of a psychotic, sex-crazed, short-fuse kind of guy. He's not a typical hero. He's mean, he's creepy, and he's incredibly pervy, which does not make him empathetic. But that's the point which we can get into when that sort of comes up. Of course, anybody paying attention will have noticed the dots and dashes at the bottom of the coffee menu, which appears to be Morse code. When it translated, it comes out to be X-J-V-O-O-J-R-Y-X-E-R-S-W, which is obviously gibberish, simply because the film hasn't provided us with the key to decode it yet. It does so later on, and this is a major component of what's called the copial cipher that we will unravel as it comes up. Now, this scene is chock full of codes and ciphers, but the majority of the movie doesn't have this many things to unravel or decode, so from here on out, I promise there isn't as much of this. But this does wrap up scene number one, and it wraps up with Sam grabbing an LA Weekly with Jesus and the Brides of Dracula on the cover. This is the band that is crucial to the film as a whole, who again come up a little bit more later. So he heads home where we can see that he is late on his rent, which is another indicator of how much of a loser he is. He can't pay his rent, but seemingly refuses to get a job, despite telling anyone that asks that he does have one. Are you at work? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, kind of a busy day. He's clearly mentally unstable, but puts on a front that makes him seem sort of normal. He actually reminds me a lot of Travis Bickle from Taxi Driver in this way. He operates as a very normal, casual human being, but as you get to know him more intimately, he is kind of psychotic. And this is no more apparent in the first scene, where we meet him at a very average coffee shop with normal clothes and a casual demeanor. Yet, as we learn more about him, it's clear he's a bit of a psycho. He beats up kids like to just about everyone he knows, can't pay rent or his car payment, and is relatively disinterested in real issues that he should be interested in. Oh, I wanted to tell you, Seventh Heaven is playing on TCM tonight. Mom. <laughs> I don't have cable. So Seventh Heaven is an interesting reference, considering it's all about a street cleaner that saves a girl's life, and then they fall in love. But this is one of many references or Easter eggs to classic movies, classic actors, and classic directors. Even the song titles on the soundtrack have references and Easter eggs built into them. It may be a way that David Robert Mitchell, the director, shows his influences, or it may be Mitchell stating that the golden age of cinema is dead, and new films stand on the shoulders of things past. This may also be a reference towards Sam's character, and as you'll see, he has an unfulfilling relationship with a girl, and then when the girl he is about to meet disappears, he may subconsciously commit to finding her in hopes of her being the one, which would explain why he dedicates so much time to finding her even though he barely knows her. Or maybe it's just because he wants to get laid and she's the only girl throughout the film that he never did it with. <laughs> So Sarah, played by Riley Coog, Korg, Coog, shows up blasting Turning Teeth, which is a song by Jesus and the Brides of Dracula, which is a song that lays out what Sam is about to discover. highlights the burial chambers and the secret tunnels underneath LA that Sam discovers later on. This song, we find out, is written by one man that is behind numerous classics, so it may be sung like this to foreshadow the Hollywood elite cult that Sarah is wrapped up in. But more on that later. So Sam is immediately attracted to her, but his peeping is cut short when his girlfriend bangs on his door. You can immediately tell there isn't really a spark between them by Sam being frustrated that she's there, not looking at her when he talks to her, and by how they just get right into smashing. But not in a normal, sexy, movie kind of way with lots of cuts, sexy music, and dim lighting. No, this is quite possibly the most unflattering sex scene in movie history. They just do it while talking over the news and chit-chatting about his signed 
Kurt Cobain poster. This is obviously hinting at his failing relationship and how sex crazed the character of Sam is. But also, it shows Sam's disinterest in real issues and his obsession with objects like his signed poster or sex. But back to the relationship. The interesting thing about the relationship, though, is that he is willingly, obviously, continue dating this girl he doesn't seem to like just because he knows he can get it with her. There isn't a spark, there isn't any connection between the two, they just do it and that seems to be it. He seems to be the type of person that dislikes change, which may be why he doesn't have a job even though he is perfectly willing to pursue a girl he doesn't know. But once they finish up, she grabs his playboy on his nightstand and they very casually talk about it. But the second she grabs his codes that he has from overanalyzing Wheel of Fortune that happens to be directly under his playboy, he gets pretty defensive about it. This shows his priorities and his hobbies in his life. He is very open and casual about sex, putting a playboy out in plain sight on his nightstand and talking about it in a laid back way. But just under that is his obsession with secrets, conspiracies, and codes, his kind of unstable side. He hides it under things and gets defensive and weird when she tries to talk about it and or even look at it. Also right under that is a gaming magazine which, evidenced by his shirt and constant references, is another one of his obsessions or hobbies. So Sam heads to the bookstore and picks up a booklet about the dog killer. He tells the clerk to pass his number on to the writer before heading home. He then sees the mystery girl's dog taking a fat dookie and gives it a treat he seems to conjure from thin air. What kind of dog do you have? Oh, uh, my dog died recently. So he heads into her apartment for a drink and we get another code. The dolls here are obviously a reference to the movie that they are watching, which is how to marry a millionaire. The code under their name is a Zodiac killer code and translates simply to Betty, Marilyn, and Lauren. It's just a code for their names. There are many times already and later on where subplots, codes, and characters seem to lead nowhere or are just dropped. I think David Robert Mitchell is reinforcing the moral of the film by doing this, which is the pointlessness of life and how we love to become involved in things that don't really matter or lead us anywhere. This is a film that begs to be dissected, but what's waiting for anyone that tries is just a giant middle finger. The film knows that by putting codes and secret messages in it, people will be compelled to crack them and more times than not end up like this. Nowhere or a code for things that we can already plainly see. This film can't wait to tell you that nothing matters, and as the film goes on, this nihilism becomes more and more obvious. And as Topher Grace says in the movie, Where's the mystery that makes everything worthwhile? We crave mystery, because there's none left. So he looks at her bracelet, she quickly changes the subject, and then he calls it a night. Oh. That's weird. It's a little late in the summer for fireworks, isn't it? As you can probably tell, the fireworks are obviously distressing her, and as we'll come to find out, they were more than likely a sign for her and her friends to hightail it wherever they were ending up going. Then Sam assaults a couple of kids like a maniac, showing his short temper, and then we see the copial cipher referenced on this TV, pointing us to look for graffiti in downtown LA, a spot that we'll see very, very soon. I don't want to pass up this Easter egg lightly though, I absolutely love it. Hiding it at the bottom of news footage that pertains to the actual story is a stroke of genius. It hides the cipher in plain sight, but doesn't draw attention to itself, since the film is still presenting at least a part of its story with this billionaire gone missing. In 1978, a Silver Lake resident discovered a can of film in his basement. In the movie, a young man holds a note in front of the camera. It reads, no one will ever be happy here until all the dogs are dead. After reading about the dog killer's possible origins, we see him go out for a little late night walk. Ha <laughs> 
So even though there was no indication that it was, this was obviously a dream sequence. One of many that run throughout the film that grow increasingly more realistic, which leads many to believe that much of this film takes place in our main character's head. And there is a lot of evidence that possibly backs this up. There's this interview with the director saying that some of the film takes place in a mythical LA. There's music that possibly hints at altered perspective. There's him playing Mario, then crawling through similar Mario tubes and so on. I'm not sure I buy into this theory though. For one, if there was ever a movie where you get out as much as you put in, it's this one. And by that, I mean that this movie is ripe for interpretation. Everyone is going to have a different perspective on this movie and what it means because there is so much left unexplained. There is so much that points to so many different things that you could look for something that you think is there and probably come out thinking that it's true when someone else doesn't see that at all. And while I do see why people think this, I just don't think I'm that on board as of right now. I think what we see is what we see unless it's made clear that it's a dream. This is just one of many theories to discuss surrounding the film, like the identity of the dog killer, who the owl lady is, or what any of this means. Another theory that I've seen pop up is about a character we are about to be introduced to, Topher Grace. Now this guy doesn't have much screen time and really only interacts with Sam, which leads people to think that he's a figment of Sam's imagination. And I don't buy this one either. I mean, the man owns house and creeps on girls with a drone. I think it's pretty safe to say that he's really Topher Grace. I mean, it's bad enough to get mugged, but then you gotta watch some dude stab your dog in front of your eyes, I mean, it's traumatizing. Anyway, they talk about the dog killer. Sam is less than interested in the conversation, and then he heads back to his complex to further investigate Sarah's newly abandoned room. He finds some of her... Uh belongings. After that, a girl walks in, grabs the box of Sarah's things, and walks off. Now, remember that news footage saying to look for the copio graffiti, right? Well, there it is! It also appears in a toilet a little bit later on, but they both say the same thing when translated, that being coffee menu. This is probably pointing to the coffee menu from earlier, which still translates to gibberish, so we must wait a bit more for the cipher key to pop up. In the meantime, Sam follows this girl to a rooftop concert slash art installation where he confronts her about Sarah. Hey, do you know do you know this girl? Do you, do you know where she is? Hey, you seriously? Ah! This is a good time to bring up one of the more prevailing theories around this film, that Sam is the dog killer. There is a fair amount of evidence to support this too, like him conveniently having a dog treat here and here, or his general lack of interest in it despite the constant flyers, graffiti, panic around it, and conversations surrounding it. Then there's this scene and his other dreamlike sequences where dogs or dog sounds seem to be haunting him. Whether or not he is the dog killer is open to interpretation, of course, but if you think about him being the dog killer while watching this, it does make things a little bit more interesting. Scenes like this also support the idea that a large portion of this takes place in his mind. Now, again, I'm not sure I buy into this, but there is a lot of perfectly convenient things just in this sequence that support it, like his car being parked right where he happens to be following this girl, witnessing the daughter of the missing billionaire find out her dad might be dead, and of course this bizarre dog barking scene. Another thing to bring up about the scene is that there's this girl here talking about vampires, which is something that comes up quite often in this movie. Vampires or Dracula is brought up around or by women a lot to probably hint at the idea of Hollywood sucking souls of up and coming women who seemingly are always chewed up and spit out by the system. The Harvey Weinsteins of the world love to suck up as many beautiful women as possible and then ditch them when their value or looks are spent. This idea of the Hollywood elites standing on the bodies of past icons and women in general solidifies near the end when you find out about the cult that buries themselves underneath the Hollywood Hills. Only the richest of men can afford this ceremony. So we hard cut to Sam walking home where he gets a phone call from the writer of the dog killer book. But his peaceful walk is cut short by someone following him. Now you may be wondering, who is it? And the answer is, I don't know. 
This is like so many other subplots and creepy things that lead nowhere, but as I've said, that's sort of the point. I've already laid out some characters, codes, and plots that have no conclusion and ultimately seem dropped, yet that's the whole purpose of the film. Whether it's to point out the clear issues Sam is blatantly ignoring to pursue a girl he barely knows, or it's simply trying to illustrate that Sam is haunted by things, that's, again, up to you. So he gets blasted by this skunk, and then he sees news footage that shows Sarah possibly being in this car fire. Then his girlfriend comes over to read him another dog killer-esque book about the owl's kiss. This is another plot thread to talk about, but she doesn't become really relevant till a bit later on. Come on in! The water's so refreshing! So now we get this bizarre dream sequence of Sarah swimming at his pool and then barking at him. <laughs> This scene is doing two things at once. Obviously it's a dream in the context of the film, but this is actually a recreation of Marilyn Monroe footage from Something's Gotta Give. It's a reference of course, but it's also a look into Sam's head. He's dreaming of this beautiful girl he wants, and since he's a fan of classic cinema based on the posters in his room, the two meld together to create something new. And just like the other pool scene with the girls barking, dog barking begins to infect his dream once again, haunting him more and more. This seems to be lightly commenting on Sam being the dog killer and re-establishing that this film is a homage and a reinterpretation of a lot of classics, melding a bunch of different things into one thing to create something new. Now we cut to Sam wandering around his neighborhood. There's this girl's butt he's staring at and a homeless guy sitting under this tree with missing dog flyers. This is not the first or last time the homeless are mentioned or seen, so keep that in mind going forward. But Sam follows this girl up the street where there are a bunch of other girls dressed exactly the same, auditioning for a movie. We see dog killer graffiti on the street, but the shot is interesting because it stages it in such a way where Sam's shadow is the only one going across the graffiti and no one else's, again implying he's the dog killer. There's four people around it, but only one person's shadow is looming over this dog killer graffiti, and it's Sam's. Now his car gets towed because he can't make the payments, and then we see this billboard, which is interesting not just because he happens to know this girl, but because of what's at the bottom left. It says E equals EE, -E, which we will use later even though it's a pretty straightforward key for what it's used for. Plus, it's kind of fun that this billboard has a cipher key on it and also says, I can see clearly now. It's a fun little cheeky reference. So he makes his way over to the dog killer book author's house, where we find out that, unsurprisingly, he's a bit of a looney tune. He has a bunch of cash in a glass box, a ton of peeps organized in some enclosure, a bunch of celebrity masks on his wall, and owl statues everywhere in sight. I really need to get a family. So I have somebody to leave these two, right? This is a funny line because he happens to get killed not long after this. So who knows if these life masks get left to anybody? Again, the movie seems to be commenting on people not being interested in things of the past, but more focused on things of the present. Then he asks Sam for a dollar bill and he circles a bird near the top right corner. He says that it's the sign of the owl's kiss and it's on every dollar bill in this country and that we live under her law. We see a bit later that she ends up killing this guy and even comes for Sam but he gets away from her and she is never seen again. This is one subplot that a lot of people are baffled by. No one seems to have a clear thought on what she could mean or what she's trying to do. Some people think she's a representation of suicide and others think that she is one of the brides of Dracula. Whenever I watch this film though, I always view this subplot that has no conclusion as just another means to draw attention to the nihilistic themes of the film. We don't get a resolution to this plot because it doesn't matter to the story. You can say that because it doesn't matter, then you could cut it entirely and not lose anything. And honestly, you'd be right, but if it were pulled out, you would be missing a little something here. Up until this point, there is no confirmation that any of the conspiracies in this film are real. They are all speculative, but once you see the owl lady, then you as an audience can buy into what Sam is doing just a little bit. Until now, he is just a crazy dude following a hunch that something is up, but once we see for ourselves that this is legit, it helps us get on board a bit more. 
But that's not to say this film is saying real life conspiracies are real though. I think a lot of people are turned off by this film because it has codes and conspiracies as a major plotline. Yet yeah, I never felt like the film was saying that these things are 100% real. I think the film is just trying to say to its audience, don't be sheep. That's it. Don't do things or follow things just because you're told to. Do what you think you should be doing and like what you want to like. Here, here, words and symbols hidden in print advertising, sexual innuendo connected with corporations. So now this author boy starts ranting about hidden messages in media before we head into his bedroom, where we finally get the key to the coffee menu cipher. Remember, the Morse code there translates to XJVO OJRY. X E R S W. So when we put it up against this key, we get what three words? Then we use the obvious key from the billboard of E equals E E, and we get what three words? When you Google this, it comes up with this website, which just so happens to share the same logo as the hobo code for this place is not safe. Now, what three words is a geocoding website that encodes words to link with specific coordinates on a map. It turns coordinates into three words. That's it. But that's where this code ends for now. No one knows what specific three words to use to keep pursuing the mystery of this film. The Reddit thread ends here, and I've tried every combination of three words I can think of that relate to the film. So I urge you to try this website out. If not to find out what this code could unravel into, then just because it's kind of fun. And even if this code never gets unraveled or it means nothing, at least I found this website that is honestly kind of fun to dick around on. So Sam wanders over to Topher Grace's house where he lies about where his car is. Where's your car? Oh, it's in the shop and repainted from all the graffiti. Come with me and you'll be oh. in a world of pure imagination. I'm sick. This is another prime example of women's exploitation in Hollywood. She comes home, gets undressed, and starts bawling, all while being perfectly in frame for these guys to see and not have any real reaction to. Who knows what she's crying about, but based on Hollywood and the conversation they were just having about wanting to be famous, I think it's safe to say she did something that she didn't want to, to try and get famous. Hollywood elite have always and will probably always have a track record of using their power as means of exploitation exploiting people, specifically women, promising them that they will be stars in return of a few favors. Even if that's not what happened to this girl, these two are still viewing her at an incredibly vulnerable moment. So Sam stumbles on this screening of a low-budget movie where the stars just happen to be standing literally on the grave of Alfred Hitchcock. He then heads to this secret show where he is forced to eat his 76 cookie. Then his friend from the rooftop concert tells him there's a secret message in the Brides of Dracula music. That there's a message? in the music. Secret message? Mm hmm So what does it say? I have no clue, dude. Obviously, they are eating and drinking on the tombs of classic actors like Grace Kelly, which is another reference to old Hollywood being trampled on. Then they go dance, Sam pukes, and then he sees the girl that he was tailing from earlier, but passes out in a graveyard before getting to her. So he heads home and begins trying to decipher the code hidden in Turning Teeth. He gets nowhere fast and decides to do what any man that is having brain fog does, choke the chicken. As he's yanking the chain, he sees the girl from the amateur movie he saw earlier and phones her up to see if she knows anything about Sarah. She tells him that she saw her at a party in a luxury neighborhood next to a giant mansion owned by an undisclosed songwriter. He then uses borderline nonsensical logic to decipher the code of this song, but it works and he goes on to put it to use. Rub Dean's head and wait under noon. Okay, rub Dean's head away under noon. What the f does that mean? He meets the homeless king who takes him to a secret underground tunnel where Sam finds one of the burial chambers the film references later on. <laughs> After 
After he sees the sights, he heads over to the author's house where he finds out he killed himself. Or did he? So as I said earlier, we can see the Owl Lady is real. And it's interesting to note that when Sam asks about his death, they say it was suicide. It seems like the cops don't know about the hidden TVs in his room, but maybe they do, and there's no Owl Lady on the tapes at all. Maybe Sam is simply seeing what he wants to see. Maybe the author really did commit suicide, and the Owl Lady is just Sam's delusional representation of that. He's clearly unstable, so maybe he fabricates things for his own enjoyment. This is, I think, the idea that a lot of people are on board with. If what is happening is all in Sam's head, it would explain why he's right about so many things, despite how far-fetched they seem. Again, not sure how much I buy into it, but it remains an interesting idea to stew on. Anyway, he heads over to a Jesus and the Bride's chess party and confronts Jesus about the secret messages in his song. Um, I was wondering if you might know how I can get in touch with Jesus. I am the wrong guy to ask. Oh, um, I mean the lead singer in the band. Side note here. I think it's very fitting that this main singer's name is Jesus and probably very intentional. There's numerous little messages about religion here and there, but this scene is just the icing on the obvious cake. People always say that God works in mysterious ways, and here when Sam is asking Jesus about his secret message in his song, he doesn't have an answer for him. He says that someone else wrote the song for him. The label gave me a few songs to record, and the rest are all mine. So which songs did they give you? Mm, turning teeth, wire mountain of malt to the Christian chip farmers. That's all the hits. Stories to belittle me, man. And it's interesting because a lot of people have struggled with God and what everything means and what he means even, which again is the point of the film. The film wants to point out the pointlessness of life and having a scene where our main character confronts Jesus and Jesus is just as lost and hopeless and helpless as him is quite the compelling little sequence. We don't have the answers to every question in life and if we try to figure them all out we may quickly find that the answers are just as worthless as the questions. I got a call from someone at the label. They said not to ask any questions but if I didn't record the songs I'd Lose my contract. You're telling me you don't know who wrote your own hit song? He didn't give a name, no! He just said it was an important piece of music by the songwriter! Sam then breaks and enters into the songwriter's house where we get one of the best scenes in movie history. So I'll just let it play out and cut in every once in a while to explain what's happening in case you don't get it. I want it that way. Tell me why. You're telling me there's hidden messages in old pop songs? Movies, television shows, everything you know. Why? That's pop culture, isn't it? Floats away like tissue paper. And I blow my nose. I find a used Kleenex, I recycle it, and there is your wedding song. Here it comes. I wanna know what love is. This is an interesting comparison. He compares pop culture to tissue paper and says he blows his nose and out comes a song. Meaning that pop culture is as shallow and as artistically thin as tissue paper. And that he doesn't even have to try to come up with a new hit song. He blows his nose and out pops a song. Which is stating that everything he writes is as shallow and boring as blowing his nose in tissue paper. I don't care what's fashionable or cool. It's all silly and it's all meaningless. I created so many of the things that you care about. The songs that give your life purpose and joy. When you were 15 and rebelling, you were rebelling to my music. Uh-oh. That's one you know. <laughs> That song was not written on distorted guitar. No, I wrote it here on piano somewhere between a blowjob and an omelet. There is no rebellion. There's only me earning a paycheck. Sam is obviously crushed to find that one of his favorite songs, Smells Like Teen Spirit, was written by this guy. He looks down at something else that he values very highly, Kurt Cobain's guitar, and seems to view it slightly differently now that he knows the art he loved 
wasn't made by the people he loves. The songwriter also reiterates what he said earlier when he says he wrote it in between an omelette and a BJ. He clearly doesn't care what kind of impact the song had and simply wrote it to get a paycheck. There was no greater message or influence for him except money, which is a harsh reality for anyone when it comes to art. Sometimes the things we love and value have no value to the people that made them. Just look at George Lucas. He completely altered the, his original Star Wars trilogy, which alienated everyone that loved it for what it was. But he doesn't care, because he's just collecting a paycheck. I am the voice of your generation, your grandparents, your parents, and all the young people that follow you. I love rock and roll. Drop another dime in the jukebox, baby. <laughs> oh, look at you. <laughs> Everything that you hoped for, that you dreamed about being a part of, is a fabrication. Your art, your writing, your culture is the shell of other men's ambitions. Ambitions beyond what you will ever understand. <laughs> That's funny to you. Well, it's a little bit funny, don't you think? This is the most important and crushing part of the sequence. He looks directly into the camera, thus talking straight to the audience, and says everything you love is meaningless. The film literally tells straight to the audience that the things they love are fake. Everything we do are ideas born out of other people's ideas that probably don't care about you or the things that you love. Then he laughs right in your face just to add insult to injury. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> Who's paying you to write these songs? <laughs> <laughs> Who's paying you to write these songs? Oh, shit. <laughs> piece of pop culture to kill one of the heads of pop culture. This is just brilliant. So Sam, now in a dark place, comes face to face with the Owl Lady. He spooks her with his new gun that he grabbed from the songwriter and she vanishes not to be seen again. This plot, like the bird who is saying something and no one knows what it is, are one and the same to me. They both represent the idea of closure or the lack thereof. You never find out who the Owl Lady is or what she is trying to accomplish, just like you never find out what the bird is saying or what it means. The reason for this is because it doesn't matter. These are two things that don't have any payoff, and that's the point. They represent a few of life's endless question marks that have no answers. Anyway, he goes to his door where a cop tells him that he is being evicted, but the cop is sympathetic to him and gives him one day to figure himself out, which of course he doesn't do. But then he sees a coyote which apparently run the world, according to the homeless king. If you ever find yourself alone with a coyote, you don't run away. You follow it. So he follows it to a house party where he meets the daughter of the now dead billionaire. He heads out on the town with her where they see a memorial to a dog. I think we're safe. We, we don't have a dog with us. Yeah, but anybody who could kill a dog wouldn't think twice about killing a person. I'm not sure that's true. If Sam really is the dog killer, as so many think he is, then this line is one of many where he completely contradicts himself. He says that the dog killer probably wouldn't kill a human, but he just did. Two scenes ago, he smashes in the head of an elderly songwriter, so either he's not the dog killer, or he is and he's lying through his teeth, which is something he has done throughout the film. I know it's not okay for me to say this, but I fucking hate the homeless. Everybody says we need to take care of them, but I think they're bullies. Poltergeists. You mean ghosts? Yeah, yeah. All they do is just float around on the edges, on the peripheries, and watch people eating delicious food, drinking beer, 
and falling in love. They can't participate, so they get jealous, and then they harass us. Obviously, this isn't the first encounter with the homeless, but it is the first time he has expressed his feelings about them. He says he hates the homeless and calls them bullies, but he is basically homeless. If the cop didn't give him one more day to pay his rent, then he would literally be homeless right now. He says they are bullies, but that's also what he's been doing this whole film. He bullied these kids, he bullied Jesus, and he bullied the songwriter so hard that he killed him. So he is essentially what he hates. This shows a complete lack of self-awareness and something I think everyone should have more of. Much of what we hate just so happens to be the things that we are, or at least partially are. But we are so up our own keisters that we don't even realize it. They then hop the fence and go skinny dipping where she shows him a bracelet she found in her dad's office, which happens to be the same one that Sarah had earlier. Someone starts shooting at them, whom we never see, and this girl gets shot. Another indicator that Sam is possibly imagining this, or at least the film is saying that art imitates life and life imitates art. This idea of art imitating life is something that the songwriter alluded to as well. So Sam heads home and while kids are playing and having a good time, he is trying to desperately solve this puzzle of what the bracelet means. He figures out that there is something on Mount Hollywood and races up there to find a shack where the girls he was tailing earlier are inside. Found a shelter down there. Some, some kind of bunker in case of a nuclear war. It's not a shelter. So what is it? A tomb. Was it ours? They're tombs for kings like me and Jefferson Sevens. So this man explains that he is a king and he is taking his possessions down into the burial chamber Sam found earlier to ascend to rich boy heaven. Also interesting to note that he says they'll be ascending but calls the idea of heaven fake. Are you talking about heaven? No, I'm talking about something exclusive and real. This is one of many of the film's purposeful contradictions. Much like so many other scenes, this one is pulling triple duty. It is simultaneously pointing out the absurdity of religious cults, commenting on Hollywood elite's exploitation of women, and the meaningless endeavor Sam took on. The Hollywood Hills, at least in this movie, are literally built on the tops of bodies of great men and exploited women. And you best believe that these rich, powerful men manipulated these beautiful women to go down to this fake ascension chamber with the promises of riches and power, which is essentially the same thing that is happening with the Harvey Weinsteins and so many other 1% individuals with too much power. Not to mention Sam has been spending the last five days of his life looking for this girl for who knows what reason, and when he finds her, she is trapped underground and doesn't want out. Well, there's no getting out now, so I may as well make the best of it. All of his efforts were in vain, and this shiny new object that was this girl is no longer available to him. And this, again, just reiterates the purpose of the film. This movie is all about finding meaning, the male gaze, and purposelessness of life, all of which come crashing in on Sam in this scene. Not only does he realize that maybe not every woman wants him, but that all this time spent on nothing could have been spent, I don't know, finding a job, paying rent, being a member of society? We're stuck on this earth for the time being, so we should try to make the best of it while we can. Why do you have dog biscuits in your pocket? I was waiting for her to take me back. I wanted to give the dog a treat and rub its ears. Just the way I used to and then everything would be good again. I don't know about you, but this seems like the most genuine thing that he has said the whole movie. Whether or not he is in fact the dog killer, this feels like he is finally coming clean with himself. He has been holding out for someone from his past that he hopes can make him whole again. The whole movie, he is just a lost soul wandering from place to place looking for meaning because he has none. 
He fell into the trap that so many of us do. We hope and pray that something big will come our way and that we'll get our comeuppance in life. We may even move to Hollywood in the hopes that we can find ourselves or at least make a paycheck. But so many of us end up spinning out in the mud, ending up a hooker or on a billboard that ends up being covered up or a washed up actor with no prospects in life. We can't go looking for meaning when we have none because we likely won't find it. We all have to make an effort to be true to ourselves in this phony, glamorous world. And if that means hooking up with the strange bird lady from next door, then so be it. Hey, what was that bird saying? I don't know.